dip in team productivity as well because whenever a development environment needs to be set up the new guy is already setting up his own environment and he has to be helped by another older member of the team that is always the case like how to set how to set up the developer environment then there is he uh, you know she will need help like understanding the code base so like cutting down the entire dip or the entire delta before you can uh, you know she can actually start contributing is almost impossible but it is always possible to reduce the delta reduce the time between a new member joining a team and starting uh, and starting to contribute to the project so the other problem is different operating systems so if you work in a bring your own laptop kind of environment so different operating systems people with uh, different operating systems or hardware will always have issues with whatever uh, development environment setup you have okay so even same operating systems can have the uh, have that problem but so it is ex like uh, just for an example Google Chrome installation on CentOS 6.5 and Ubuntu 12.04 is extremely different. It's not even like you have installed Google Chrome. You have to use a script which does that. Till 6.2, I think it worked properly. You have installed, and after that, you have to use a script. Just install a simple Google Chrome. CentOS. So then there is inconsistencies between procedures. So if you are having different in a different hardware, different environments. So to achieve the same thing, you have different procedures for on for every uh, different person. If somebody has to check out the uh, check out the database, so rather than just running PC for minus U root whatever, it might differ from operating system. Or if somebody, God knows why, but brings in a Windows laptop in between, so or somebody has to form sim links. So even between Ubuntu and CentOS, the location where you form the sim links may vary. So to attain the same exact thing, thing, thing you will be following different procedures. So some might not know about other themselves, which is a lot of time wasted rather than actually contributing to the code. Then there is inconsistent environments. So you have I already covered different operating systems, right? So now. Imagine your development environment and the difference between that and all the other environments you might have. Like you might have a CI staging or QA, or even the, suppose you do not have that big a prod, but but there there will always be a difference between your developer environment and the CI staging and the QA environment or any other environment which you use. So that leads to a lot of unexpected. Errors or behaviors. So you might work on something. Okay, it works on your machine, and then you push it, and you it might fail. Okay. So now works works on my machine. Phrase is like very hard to like evaporate off this planet, but you can still work towards cutting it down a lot. So then there are dependency conflicts. So, if you are working on multiple code bases on the same machine, so you might be working on a Ruby or Rails pro like two Ruby or Rails projects requiring different version of Rails. You will have to use RVM, and it's actually really complicated to do that. Or like while using two different versions of Ruby and two different versions of Rails, or if you are working on a Python Django project which requires different versions. So, something as simple as suppose you added something as a gem file. Like you needed a dependency for one of your apps, you added, you installed the gem, and you added that to your gem file. After that, your second version also works, which which also using that dependency, but you did not add it to your gem file, and you just pushed it, it fails on CI. That time, at that time itself, or even something simple like if you're using two data, like you will be using suppose Postgres for both the apps, and then you will be. And different versions of Postgres, so you'll have to run the Postgres servers server on two different ports. And when you're running servers on two different ports, then before pushing it to CI, you'll have to change the port to whatever, or you can either use environment variables. But it's still a lot of pain. So I'm going to talk about virtualization and 
virtual box. So there are three types of virtualization: full virtualization, partial virtualization, and para virtualization. So for this, we'll just be I'll just be talking about uh, full virtualization. So full virtualization is like software is like VMware and VirtualBox they implement for full virtualization. Para virtualization is used by uh, like software like Zen. They use para virtualization and AWS uses Zen. And the para virtualization is not that much in, uh, is not at all in the, the scope of this talk because para virtualization requires modifying the uh, guest operating system. While full virtualization does not. You can just put any ISO you want and run the software just out of the box and as you wanted to. So uh, I'll just be covering VirtualBox and because it's free, open to use, and if anybody wants to try it, they can download it. And also, in the scope of Vagrant, it works well with Vagrant. So that also. So VirtualBox try using the latest edition if you try it. So Vagrant, uh, Vagrant is a wrapper over VirtualBox, which makes managing virtual machines really easy. Okay, so Vagrant is uh, won't offer you if you want to use GUI or VirtualBox, then it's not really helpful. But Vagrant does offer a lot of other things. Like you are abstracted from a lot of things which you would have to go through if you had used VirtualBox. So uh, something as simple as synchronization of folders, getting internet connectivity in Vagrant, or like just the speed with which you can get up a machine. A spin of a virtual machine using Vagrant is very easy, and the interaction you have uh, with Vagrant managed virtual machines, like you can you spin up a terminal, SSH into the machine, and just use it there itself. And Vagrant also offers a lot of other features like uh, configuration management, which I'll be talking. So Vagrant also uses providers. So Vagrant is a wrapper over virtual box. It, you can also use VMware with it. So like uh, software like full virtualization software like VMware and VirtualBox are called providers and like this is not exactly right because it does not only work with full virtualization implement, implementing software it also works with Docker and LXEs right now but before there wasn't any support for Docker and LXEs. So Vagrant uses the dot box format to package its virtual uh, virtual machine. So every Vagrant virtual machine is a package as dot box. Okay, now that dot box is has uh, two parts. One is the actual dot box, one has the actual disk and where the operating system is installed and all that. But that uh, that Vagrant does nothing with. What Vagrant is concerned with the metadata JSON in the dot box package. And after getting the metadata JSON, it finds out what is the provider of this uh, of this virtual machine. It might be VMware, it might be VirtualBox, and then it just passes on that disk to the full uh, virtualization implementing software. So, oh, if you have any questions at any point of time, just shoot fire. Back. So, uh, whatever Vagrant images also you download, like whatever .box files also you download will also be in the .box format only. That's the best format which works. So, so this is as e how easy it is to get up a Vagrant, uh, Vagrant machine. Okay, so I'll be giving you a demo of... So here are the CentOS
okay which i downloaded which i'll eventually tell you from where i downloaded so now if i want to spin off a vm with this right so if i want to spin off a vm with this like usually if you are using virtual box or something you need the dot iso file or the vm test file but and then go through the entire installation procedure and all that other stuff so here i just do okay so now it has added a box here in the main home dot vagrant directory okay so there i created a box named demo so i ran the command vagrant box add demo okay so vagrant box comes together now vagrant box has a list of other commands like remove update list etc and then i give it a name demo and i just link it to the box okay now this box doesn't need to be downloaded as well you can just uh, if you just have a dot if you have it uploaded somewhere on a cloud or something you can just specify the url it will download it for you and add it okay so once this is added i need to create the vagrant file so th for that i do vagrant in vagrant initialize Help me. Box demo. So, so now I have a vagrant file here. I'll be telling more about the vagrant file. So, if I just need to run this VM now, let's do a vagrant now. So this is how it comes up. So now this is where. it will be mounting my current folder so from the folder from which i ran the vagrant up or where the vagrant file or whatever our project root is that will be mounted in slash vagrant directory this is for the ssh now the machine is up i can ssh it to it using my own terminal itself so i don't even have to use a third party to do something for that and uh, just do run vagrant ssh and if i go to vagrant folder so all my files in the same uh, in that folder is are here so now suppose if you have something like a java project or uh, say a ruby project so rather than uh, using so if you are using something like virtual box so there you will be using uh, to edit the code you might be using something inside the virtual box gui or you might have synchronized folder there as well with a lot of pain but here i can just use the id my java id outside and compile the code run the test whatever i want to do inside the vagrant machine <laughs> so this is so these are this just three commands you can even cut it down with the new new version okay right and <coughs> Okay, now I showed you the vagrant file. Now that vagrant file is used to manage the configurations of the entire VM. I mean, it is powerful enough to do even uh, change the memory if you want in your virtual box machine, which the vagrant is managing, or like forward some ports from the uh, uh, virtual box machine to here, bridge adapters between your connection to. the way uh, so that you get internet connectivity inside way, uh, the virtual machine as well and also you can plug in like even if you are uh, if you are using some provision like chef or puppet so you can plug it in in the uh, you can specify it in the vagrant file itself so i'll be showing you some demos of vagrant files
So this is my box name demo. But I can also have a box URL here. Like if I uploaded that box somewhere, or even a file respective, uh, like a file system respective URL, box URL here as well. So this is just a very basic example of a Wakerd file. It does nothing. So I'll show you some of the more advanced ones. So this is my previous project's uh, Wakerd file, where specifying the URL element which is in the same directory, which was in the same directory as the Wakerd file itself, and then I'm specifying an IP. So if I run any web server inside Vagrant, so they will be forwarded. So that web server, if I want to access it from outside the virtual machine. So I can just go to this IP and uh, whatever that web, web server is uh, serving, I can get access to it outside the big, uh, virtual machine. Now, I will cover the code folder later. Now this is my sync folders. So I am syncing whatever was in the folder before mine into a folder called slash project inside my virtual machine. So like I had like 23 repos outside that folder and all of them were sync inside slash project. So I can work on all of them outside and run whatever builds I want inside my VM. Okay. Now something like this, right? So I need to clear this up that if you're using a JavaScript app, like if you're using uh, something like AngularJS or something, right? So with AngularJS, once you like build it, so there will be a distribution folder form. But while working, you won't be using building it again to get immediate feedback. Like you just add some, like you just add suppose a header, and you don't want to build it again and all that. So at that time, it's also better to have the actual Angular JS build compiled on your computer as well, on the development environment, on the host machine as well, rather than always blindly go with Vagrant and do whatever you want inside the Vagrant. So then, so last budget you were using Puppet. This is a very specific thing. So this is how plugged in my Puppet manifest and modules in the Vagrant file. So I'll be covering Vagrant provision later. So, Vagrant will allow you to plug in different provisioners like Chef, Puppet, Ansible or even Shell. So, the thing with that is, you can, uh, whenever you want to bring up your Vagrant, okay, so suppose you did some changes and modified some things but, or you got something uninstalled and you want to fix it. So, you can just run the command Vagrant provision or Vagrant dot minus minus provision to provision your Vagrant box. So, uh, so the ideal scenario would be like uh, whatever you install in your box, you have automation scripts for that as well. So, if you install even a simple thing like NTP, it's better to include it in the automation script as well. And so, it's very easy for you to just destroy the entire Vagrant box and recreate it again using the provisions. Okay. So, there we saw Puppet. I'll show you just a simple example. So here I am forwarding my ports as well. So I will be, I am forwarding port 8080 to 8000. Okay, so I will be running my uh, server or I will be listening on 8080 inside my virtual machine and from outside I access it using localhost 8000. And inside my virtual machine I will be running it on 0.0.0, .0 like for any all IPs at 8000, 8080. 
So this error comes when there is a difference between your virtual box version and the box dot box which you are using. So usually you can just install a plugin like vagrant dash vp guest to resolve this issue, but it involves in uh, installing some kernel headers and it takes time. So I removed that plugin for the demo purposes. Okay, one question. The uh, for port forwarding that we have written is in uh, configuring file of header. Yeah. So when it starts, it's automatically forwarding the port on it. Yeah. What you have actually uh, built out. So I'll show you the vagrant file uh, because of the guest editions this one. Okay. So this is how I have plugged in my uh, first I show the port forward. This is a simple thing. So guest has 8080. So suppose if you are if you're working on a Django app or a Ruby app which has their own single threaded development server. Or even if you are just using Nginx or Apache or something. So you listen on 8080 on your guest machine and on your host machine you use 8000 to uh, reach to that port. You just use localhost 8000. So whenever you hit 8000, the, it will be forwarded to 8080 inside the guest machine. Okay. Now this can be used for databases as well and other, other things as well. So I can forward multiple ports for multiple things. Yeah. You can also Okay, this is, so you can also uh, have communication between two vagrant boxes running simultaneously using port forwarding. Like suppose you do not want your database to be, suppose your actual system is very loosely coupled and you have a database somewhere, you have an app somewhere. So you can also have vagrant boxes or vagrant, you can also write vagrant configurations like where you forward one port from here and uh, so you can have a database in one vagrant box itself and your uh, App running on another vagrant box to give a more realistic environment. Okay, and just if you don't want to mess around with the vagrant at that time, then you can just use nginx to forward whatever you want and proxy and everything. So this is where I plug in my chef. So now chef solo. So this particular dot box did not have chef, chef solo installed. So what I do? This is not item important though. What I do is Install Chef Solo whenever I provision my vagrant. If I want to provision my vagrant, this install.sh will install Chef Solo for me. This is not item important. If it's installed, it will still install over the top of, over top of it. And then it will just run this recipe banana for me, which right now just installs NTP. Thank you. So, this is an example of Chef plugin. Okay. So, I'll be giving a bit of answer, only a bit of Ansible as well. So, with all these chef, puppet and all that, so Ansible is also another orchestration, provisioning, configuration management tool. So, the advantage Ansible gives you over, uh, not really an advantage, uh, like the thing which is really good about Ansible is, you do not need any client side agent installed. So like in Chef Client Server, you need Chef Client installed. But with Ansible, you don't need anything installed. So your provisioner, so, uh, sorry, uh, your machine, you can just sit with one machine. You can have 10 computers right in front of you. You can just provision all of them at the same time using simple SSH without even touching them. Just given that they have open internet, open SSH access. So if you want to install, uh, and suppose Ruby on 10 machines, 10 given machines. So you can, or if you have like 10 vagrant boxes that's running at the same time. So you can just run, run the one script one time and it will provision all 10 of them together without even having to install anything on the client side. So that is one example. What I chance of using. So Vagrant also provides a module for Ansible. Like I showed you for Chef and showed it to you for Puppet, right? So things like this, you'll actually have to go to the documentation to, when you're actually implementing it. And the Vagrant documentation is amazing. So uh, it also gives you a plugin for module for Ansible, right? So for this, I won't be covering the plugin for Ansible because if I actually cover Ansible, you can use it uh, without that plugin and provision Vagrant box like that only. You don't actually need to use the plugin ever unless, like it's better if you use it for the entire project and 
have a vagrant file provision uh, all, all the time. But you can also choose uh, easily choose not to. Tell you why. So I'll show you an uh, Ansible script which I have written and provision a vagrant box with it. So, like Chef has recipes and cookbooks, so Ansible has playbooks and roles. So, one playbook can have multiple roles. And a role can be, you can decide whatever, multiple things group together. Like if you want to install MySQL, so you wouldn't just be installing MySQL server, you'll be installing MySQL client, MySQL common, and everything along with it. Right, so you can have all of them grouped together in one role. Okay, so, is it visible? Okay, so here I define the hosts. Okay, the first side is uh, Ansible is in YAML syntax, so you don't actually need to know coding to uh, write, like provision using Ansible. So uh, here I define hosts, which Ansible picks up from etc <coughs> Ansible and hosts. Well, I specify the IP which I want provision and the uh, username which it will use to SSH into that uh, machine and the password. Okay, this is not really a safe method, like usually it's preferred to have use SSH keys, but since I'm provisioning my local beacon as well. So this is a so remote user. So the user I want to use on the remote is vagrant. Okay. So environment variable I'm defining as Java home. Okay. And these are the roles I'm running. First is users, then repos, host, zeros, Java, and MySQL. Okay. So this will run uh, every role in the in that particular order in which I listed. Okay. So I'll go to utils. So it's as simple as this. Like if you want to install Git, so you just like even if Git is installed, you might want to ensure that you want to install Git. Okay. So it's as simple as install Git and just say say the state. You can specify a particular version if you want, or you can just specify the state you want. You you want or the latest just say latest. So this is one of the simpler ones. And then this is the repo script where I'm actually adding a bunch of repositories in CentOS. So all these will be added to slash yum slash repos dot d. And so uh, I'm adding repos so that I can in future run easily yum install on the softwares I want rather than actually download the RPMs and put it in the VMs. Is it all understandable? Is it all clear? Like repository made by yourself or is pulling from? It can be anything, right? So I'll show you the dot repo. So this is the like the Apple repo I'm adding. Like Apple source, base, updates. I'm adding all the repos. Here and I'm placing it in the repos dot d and then activating activating all the repos one by one. Okay, so with this you can have something like so now this is a kind of a decision making thing as well. So suppose if you have you are building a machine which you need to provision and you have three different environments, say so CI, QA, and staging. Okay, now you'll be provisioning all these three with all the packages you know, right? So, suppose if you want to install 10 packages and you know all their names. So, uh, you have multiple options and they are not available on any repo, they are available on different repos. So, the best option there might be to just take an alternative, create a repo with all the packages you want 
on a cloud and add it as a custom repo to your Ansible scripts. And using that, you can provision all the boxes rather than transferring each and every dot rpm files and installing it or adding multiple repos and increasing the jam update. update. Is it clear? The series is it clear? So this is actually do. And then I have a so Java is kind of so here setting Java homes. So from what I have mentioned in the answer, I did not find a particular method to set an environment variable directly. Like you have to run a bash script to set an environment variable. Okay. So that's why I wrote bash script. So is the Java home and the Java home variable I'm setting and the default. So So it's importing it right now. So basically that command uh, that command is used to execute that playbook and I showed you the XC Ansible host directory. So that will be used to SSH into the vagrant box which right now is not set up. Yes. SSH into the vagrant box on that IP and I'll run the Ansible <laughs> there. So, the advantages of using Vagrant is, so suppose if you have like multiple environments, you have CI, staging and everything. So, with that you can have, so whatever operating system you have on, on all those environments, you can have the same operating system running on a development environment. The entire team can be running the same operating system and similar configuration as your CI and your environment. And so, therefore, there will be less less amount of surprises. So, something as simple as, simple as say, a local to stop a Postgres database from anything. So if you don't have your LC all set and it's unknown on an open to box, that will uh, fail the PG cluster which is called a you uh, want to get Postgres database. So, we avoid a lot of surprises and then there is a vagrant. So then there is a vagrant box. The, the ease of distribution which you get. So once I'll uh, show you the vagrant package command. So once you have everything installed on your box, suppose you do not want to write automation scripts, but once you have everything installed on the box, right? So you can run a simple 
vagrant package the vm name and id and the final box file which you want made so it will generate a dot box file at the end which you can distribute among your team and they can just straight away start using uh, like they will have the entire development environment set up and they can just straight away start uh, contributing and there is the ease of use over vm uh, over vms like all the problems which are highlighted can also be solved with a vm but vm adds a lot of complexity and this gives a very good abstraction over a regular virtual machine and also it's very faster to uh, it's very fast to bring bring it up and everything as well as well so in an ideal scenario you will have automation scripts written to provision a vagrant box you will have the entire team using the same vagrant box and now vagrant also introduced their vagrant cloud so in that you can actually version control your vagrant box but it is not exactly as you as a regular uh, as similar to a regular version control Destroys the older box and recreates the and uh, creates a new one which you have pushed. Okay, but is this uh, is this more abstraction over simple copy pasting from one file? Okay. So use these are my resources. Any I guess that eight minutes left. I can cover more commands or maybe another. Is the question that in your scenario you are using Ansible, right? Uh, you are using Ansible out of the yeah. original itself. Yeah. Any reason why you use it that way instead of using it? Because if you run Vagrant, it itself creates the original. yeah. But so suppose if I made a script uh, in Ansible outside of Vagrant. Right, so I had oh, I started on multiple boxes and it forwarded a lot of codes and that's why that vagrant box wasn't able to start up. So that's why I wasn't able to show it. So uh, why I did this and why I said I prefer this. So you just write one set of Ansible scripts, right? And then the same scripts you use to provision your uh, local vagrant box, the same uh, scripts you can use to provision your CI on the cloud or your QA. So. Uh, rather than hooking it up inside the uh, using the vagrant module, you can use it uh, use the same thing for everything, and you can also use the same scripts to provision somebody else's machine. Uh, suppose if you actually have a laptop with CentOS, same installation. Any questions? Good. Yeah, I last one simple. I know it is very simple. Because I never use. Ah, vagrant one. Suppose I have virtual machines on Zen environment on other VM or ESP, etc. So can I use the vagrant vagrant or all of them? Ah, so Zen you can't. I mean, there are methods and ways to do it, but like out of the box, 
you can't even use Vagrant on a dot .is or file. You'll have to use something like PV or something to install. And suppose if you have pre-existing uh, full virtualization software disk, like the flat files in which they pretend as hard, uh, which they uh, emulate as hard disks. So on that, there are again uh, other plugins which you can use to form a dot box file out of that and use Vagrant with that. Okay, so uh, did I answer it? Yes, okay. What about ESS? Yeah, so I don't know about uh, ESS, but uh, Oracle box is the same thing. There are uh, plugins outside, but out of the box, it's uh, like so. I told you about the dot box file format, right? There is uh, like the biggest part of the file just goes to the provider, and the box.json file needs to be formed. So that that is what Vagrant uses. Works only works in Fusion also and now with Hyper-V, like just like one week back they installed uh, for my book on Microsoft. Okay, thanks to Inger Dixon and Anand who's in this presentation.